Welcome everyone, and I'm glad again to present one of our uh, PhD completion seminars, and today it's uh, Alex Wilson. So Alex has had a bit of a circuitous route into bioengineering. He, he completed a, a BSc in biomedical science at Auckland, went on to do a postgraduate diploma in medical sciences, and then did a, a, a master of operations research, which he graduated with a first class honors. So at the end of this, I believe you worked in industry for a short yeah. period of time. And then uh, the lure of bioengineering research proved irresistible. So he came to the ABI to do a PhD, where he promptly used his wide array of skills to back the John Carbon Prize for the best oral presentation at the MedSci meeting um, in 2013, I believe. So um, Alex is now going to tell us all about uh, his work looking at cardiac remodeling uh, in uh, heart failure using a rack molecule. <laughs> Do we want lights off? Probably. Yes. Okay, lights off then. Can we get the lights off, please? <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yeah, so um, I'm really excited to share with you my exit talk. The title of my thesis was Biomechanics of Cardiac Remodeling and Heart Failure, and I was supervised by Ian Le Grice and Martin Nash. Now, in preparation for this talk, I decided to do one last little study, and that was to ask a few people what their advice would be they would give to themselves you know as a PhD student just starting out and I got a, a range of responses and I've tried to put some of the good ones in here this one was from Ted it'll be hard nothing will work the first time and there'll be long nights but it'll be worth it in the end I thought that was a really nice one um, but not con not being content just to share that with you I decided to look at the, the very newest and the very best ways to share information with people and it turns out that it's memes now so I, I converted some of the advice into meme format and uh, so for this one if you assume anything is going to work first time you're going to have a bad time and I, I found that to be true nothing worked first time during my PhD um, another piece of advice I'd say is try not to ask people when they're finishing uh, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's a bit of an annoying question. You can ask it, but you can expect perhaps a frothy response. <laughs> uh, so part one. So heart failure is a condition where the heart pumps insufficient blood to meet the requirements of the body. So um, symptoms of this are, include fatigue, shortness of breath, and pulmonary congestion. Patients with heart failure have trouble performing physical activity, uh, have difficulty sleeping, and have higher rates of depression. Heart failure is a progressive disease, which means that the heart structure and function change through time, and this is termed cardiac remodeling. You can see um, two different ways in which the heart can fail to pump blood. Either the wall is so thin that it's not able to effectively contract down and eject blood, or uh, sometimes the walls are so thick that the heart can't fill properly. 37 million people increasing have heart failure worldwide and uh, these have different ranges of uh, severities and end-stage heart failure has a one-year survival rate of about 6%, very low. Uh, the standard of care for end-stage heart failure is heart transplantation but the number of patients with heart failure worldwide continues to rise and the number of donor hearts available is nowhere near keeping up with demand. There are other surgical options such as left ventricular assist devices but these come with their own risks and complications. So really the ideal treatment is some sort of drug treatment that's able to reverse cardiac remodeling and so sort of to this end uh, my PhD research was to try to better understand the relationship between structure and function in cardiac remodeling. As I mentioned briefly, heart failure has a spectrum. So 
the, the functional side, the main metric that we look at is the ejection fraction, which uh, pretty intuitively is the amount of blood pumped out relative to the initial amount. And so in a normal person, uh, normal is defined as anything above 50%, but it's typically around 60, 65, uh, depending on what measurement technique you use. And as uh, heart failure progresses through age, a heart may turn out like this, where it has a thick wall and a thin cavity. So this heart has the muscle mass to eject down and eject a good proportion of the small volume. Uh, and on the other hand, you may have a dilated heart with a thin wall. So a large cavity, but it doesn't have the muscle mass to eject a decent proportion of this blood. So we call this uh, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. Uh, and so instead of using human data, I focused on an animal model, uh, allowed me to do more uh, invasive techniques which you can't do ethically in humans. And the particular animal model I used was the spontaneously hypertensive rat, which is a well-studied animal model where uh, you have a rat that develops high blood pressure early in its life, and this leads to uh, cardiac remodeling. I used a control rat, uh, genetically related Wistar Kyoto. In previous studies, uh, I knew from the outset sort of what to expect. At three months, the SHRs have a more or less normal uh, heart structure, heart geometry, uh, but they, they do have high blood pressure at this point, but it takes a while for the heart to change in response to this. By 12 months, we see a concentric hypertrophy, thick walled, and the ejection fraction can go up above what's normal here. Uh, and then as the disease progresses, this can balloon out into a dilated ventricle at uh, 18 and 24 months. I was also interested in looking at a specific treatment. So in this case, I looked at the angiotensin con converting enzyme inhibitor treatment, or from now I'll just call it ACE inhibitor. So ACE inhibitors lower blood pressure, uh, and they're also known to alter myocardial collagen. So this is a study done with SHRs, which showed that if you start ACE inhibitor treatment early, you can reduce the stiffness, and this is, they showed, related to a reduction in the amount of collagen. And so we were interested in including this treatment as another sort of microstructural variable to look at uh, how this alters the structure function relationship. And so we treated some SHRs uh, with, ACE, with the ACE inhibitor quinapril, and from now on I'll refer to them as the TSHR or treated SHRs. And so the experimental design, uh, we studied them at three time points, roughly corresponding with the uh, time points that I showed you previously. So three months uh, expecting normal SHRs, 14 months we're expecting concentric hypertrophy, and we're expecting dilation at 21 months. And the treated SHRs, not quite sure what to expect from these, probably closer to normal due to their treatment lowering their blood pressure. Um, so previous studies of SHRs have used echocardiography, which um, you can use to get measurements of LV geometry, but you can't get the same sort of spatial resolution that you can with cardiac MRI. And the advantage of cardiac MRI is that you can use, it, you can use multiple planes. So in this case, we used three pla long axis planes that's the, the, the plane shown here, and six short axis planes, so that's the plane across. So nine planes in total, and this gives good 3D coverage of the left ventricular geometry, uh, so we're able to fit these nice LV models, which later on down the line we can use for simulations if we want. So that was one of the main novel measurement techniques in this part of the research, and also obtaining left ventricular pressure um, so these animals underwent a surgery where we inserted a pressure catheter in an artery in the neck and advanced it down into the left ventricle 
and this allowed uh, left ventricular pressure measurements. These numbers here are just the, uh, the sample sizes at each time point. So between 5 and 10 uh, gave us reasonable statistical power at each time point. Um, so blood pressure and LV mass. So first thing to note is the SHRs have a very high blood pressure. Great. Uh, that's what we want to see. Uh, and this carries on to a large LV mass. Uh, as we see here, so we correct for body mass to make sure it's not just due to the animal being too large. So high blood pressure, high LV mass. Uh, another thing we see is the ACE inhibitor treatment effectively lowers the blood pressure and we note that this also has the effect of preventing this increase of LV mass. Uh, one thing to note is that the LV mass continues to increase past this time point uh, so one of the problems we had with this study was that a lot of the more sick SHRs tended to die either before we studied them or during the uh, surgery and MRI stage. So these 21-month SHRs are biased a little bit towards the more healthy ones and so um, that's part of the reason why we, we don't see so much this progression towards dilatation and thin walls. Uh, we see dilatation, but we see that there continues to be thick walls at this time point. Uh, another thing to note is generally low blood pressure from controls and uh, lower levels of LV mass. So ejection fraction, um, the SHRs had low ejection fraction uh, from an early time point combination of slightly high LV mass and mean arterial pressure there. Um, with the treatment we see that from the 14-month the, the time point we see a sort of a protective effect in this old age uh, and so by this time point the ACE inhibitor treated animals are significantly uh, greater ejection fraction than their untreated counterparts. It's interesting to note that the stroke volume doesn't change significantly between animals at any time point uh, and again we would have expected the SHRs to drop off at this time point uh, but we don't see that because they're the slightly more healthy ones. Taking heart rate into consideration we see again no significant difference. The really interesting point is the amount of cardiac work that is performed by these animals, the SHRs, at this final time point. So although uh, they're performing the same amount of cardiac minute work, so ejecting the same amount of blood per minute to the body, uh, they're performing much more work in order to maintain this normal level of activity. It's previously been found that Efficiency of the heart is inversely correlated with the mass. Um, so we can expect from, from those previous studies that this 21-month SHR is likely to be the least efficient at pumping blood. So this, coupled with this high level of cardiac work, uh, suggests a situation which is very quickly going to degenerate into heart failure. Um, and this is likely why a lot of these SHRs uh, died before we could study them as they uh, rapidly declined. With the combination of the volumes from the MRI data and the pressure throughout the cycle, we were able to generate these pressure volume loops, which show quite nicely the differences between the groups. Uh, the SHRs having this much higher pressure uh, against which the heart has to pump. This, this difference here is the stroke volume and you can see that uh, they're not too different between groups. Uh, we can see that the SHRs are right shifted indicating that these hearts are bigger overall and that the treated SHRs have this lower blood pressure and this lowers this area which corresponds with the stroke work. So by lowering uh, the blood pressure, really lowering that the work the heart needs to do to pump blood. So just a summary of part one, 
It was that uh, SHRs had similar cardiac output uh, with the control and treatment groups, but in order to perform this normal level of work, they had uh, normal level of ejection, they had to perform much more work. And the ACE, in ACE inhibited treatment effectively lowered blood pressure and correspondingly hypertrophy and the work measurements. Um, so some of the advice that I got from PhD students who had finished was they would tell themselves not to do it. And once it, someone said, oh, the, the gain of fly, you fools. Uh, I debated about whether to include this. I don't want to scare off anyone. Uh, but I think if I went back and told myself before I started the PhD just how much work uh, it would be, I would be pretty daunted and might be put off. Um, but having been through it, it's sort of a, a good feeling knowing, knowing that I was able to undertake such a huge project and it gives me a bit of confidence to undertake big projects in the future. Um, and another thing is, you know, if you can weather the storm, <laughs> sometimes it, you might end up with an unexpected gift. So uh, it is a battle, but if you make it through, you might uh, get something nice for your, for your efforts. Uh, so on to part two. So, this part focuses on ventricular torsion. So ventricular torsion is the relative rotation of the ventricular apex relative to the base. Uh, and in this talk, I've used this approximation of torsion. Uh, relating it to structure and function, torsion has been previously shown to correlate with uh, ejection fraction and also geometric values such as sphericity uh, and also left ventricular wall thickness. And so I was really interested to see uh, how torsion would play out in this data set with a range of different left ventricular geometries. So the most important methodology in this part was tagged MRI. Uh, so for tagged MRI, there are RF pulses which lay down these dark bands on the myocardium and then as the heart contracts, these dark bands move with the tissue. And so this allows you to effectively uh, take material points throughout the cardiac cycle. These can then be tracked. Um, and by having multiple short axis slices, we can take a, an apical and a basal slice and compare the rotations uh, in order to get the torsion Another thing you can do is to um, get some strains, this is the radial and circumferential strains, uh, which are also interesting to look at. Um, so based on the geometric side of, of previous studies, the expected uh, result was that there was going to be increased torsion uh, with increased wall thickness, uh, but we found the opposite. Uh, the SHRs showed consistently lower torsion than the control animals uh, and the treated animals uh, showed higher than their untreated counterparts and a bigger difference at the 21 month time point just to um, show why this was unexpected. So the LV mass to EDV ratio is sort of a 3D estimate of the, the, the wall thickness compared to the size of the lumen so we would expect um, based on previous geometric studies that the highest torsion would be in these two groups but that's where we found the lower values um, and it's seeming that this isn't the best uh, geometric uh, metric to look at in, in this data set. Uh, also with sphericity we found that torsion didn't correlate with uh, with this in this data set, looking over all the animals, uh, and I tried looking over all the animals um, for the, the wall thickness as well. So a little bit surprising um, finding that, uh, unfortunately, no correlation between torsion and the geometric variables in this data set. Uh, looking at the uh, functional variables, encouragingly, it seem to be that the 
torsion was overridingly being pulled down in the thick walled animals by their low ejection fraction. I went back over the studies that looked at the relationship between torsion and uh, wall thickness and it seemed that a lot of those studies were uh, thick walled hearts that weren't having also uh, problems with ejection. So uh, it seemed that this is a confounding variable um, and perhaps if those other studies were looking at heart failure patients rather than patients just with thick walled uh, and had a low ejection fraction they may not have found the same result. Uh, in any case with both ejection fraction and circumferential strain we see that the SHRs are clustering around these poor systolic performance and that's carrying over to these uh, lower values of torsion. And just looking at the, the group differences, we can see that the, um, they're looking quite similar. Uh, so the, the SHR is having lower than control at all time points uh, and the treated animals showing this uh, slight improvement with age. And uh, again, pretty similar with ejection fraction, just sort of confirming that uh, torsion is uh, much more closely related to whether or not the heart is performing well rather than its shape. And so just a summary of this part of the work, the SHRs had low torsion compared with controls, which was against our expectation of high torsion uh, with hypertrophy. The no correlation was found over all the hearts between torsion and sphericity, uh, but torsion correlated well with other systolic functions such as the ejection fraction and rate of strain, circumferential strain. Uh, this, this piece of advice was from Mahia. Start writing as soon as possible no matter what stage or how significant the work or result is. Uh, and in meme format, this is the easily distracted boyfriend, uh, ignoring the sensible option of r starting to write as soon as possible uh, and uh, considering, oh, I'll just write up in the last few months, so try not to do this. Um, another piece of advice that I would give is that um, it's important to uh, take care of your colleagues. Uh, PhD work can be a pretty tough slog um, and so it's really good if you can uh, give someone some, some words of advice or to give them a bit of support, uh, a little bit can go a long way. Uh, so on to part three. And this part of the work focused on the structure of the myocardium. And so just uh, zooming in on this left ventricle that I've been uh, focusing on in a more global sense, you can see that the myocyte orientation changes across the wall, this change in fibre direction. And zooming in further at the tissue level, we can see that the, there are really three unique um, myocardial coordinate axes. So this uh, fibre direction, and then within sheetlet um, in this direction, and then normal to them both, the normal direction, and that's uh, the coordinate system that I'll be using through this part. And so we can see that myocytes bundle uh, into these sheetlets about uh, four cells in thickness, and that between uh, these sheetlets we have these cleavage planes where the collagen connects between the, the two sheetlets. We also have collagen connecting the myocytes and also uh, thick paramecial cords running alongside the myocytes. So a lot of this uh, work in this part is focused on the, the sheetlet structure and function, um, which is quite important for, for function. Um, so at the inner wall, we see that there's wall thickening of about 40% at the ventricular level, uh, which is much more than can be accounted for the sort of 15% shortening of the myocytes themselves. And so there must be uh, some other mechanism contributing to this wall thickening. 
uh, and it's sliding of the sheetlets relative to one another. So in this relaxed state, we see that uh, during um, ejection, this endocardial surface and the schematic moves up, allowing these sheetlets to slide relative to one another uh, and contributing to this 40% ejection, um, which really helps in ejecting blood from the ventricle. Um, and so the key measurement technique in this part was the uh, extended volume confocal imaging. And so I've got uh, two images up here which have previously been published. Uh, on this top left we've got a 12 month WKY which doesn't have a lot of collagen uh, indicated in yellow. Uh, my site's in this red colour. Not a lot of collagen and the collagen that is there is mainly this uh, thick paramecial collagen alongside the myocytes. In the SHR we see immediately this thick uh, deposition of collagen between sheetlets uh, and also this clear ringing of collagen uh, surrounding myocytes which is the endomesial collagen. So the, the novel imaging that I performed in my study was of the treated SHR myocardium and it's kind of clear that the structure of, of the treated SHR doesn't quite match either of these. We see that uh, there's clear spaces between the layers, which is more like the WKY, uh, but there is this thick ringing of endomesial collagen surrounding the myocytes, which is more similar to the SHRs. Just confirming, <coughs> excuse me. Just confirming uh, what we see from visual inspection of the images. We took uh, representative 2D slices from each of these uh, four samples and took 2,000 pixels and classified them as either being. Uh, collagen or not collagen, and if collagen, the type of collagen present. So the paramecial collagen is both the uh, thick collagen between sheetlets and also these cords running alongside the myocytes, and the endomesial collagen uh, are the, the, the rings surrounding the myocytes. And so we sound, found that for the treated SHRs, they had low levels of paramecial collagen compared to their uh, untreated SHRs, which is mainly due to the lack of collagen between sheetlets, so this is great, confirming what we see. Um, WKYs have a, a little bit more of these um, thick paramecial cords, uh, but still pretty low. In terms of the endomesial collagen, the treated SHRs have higher levels surrounding the myocytes, uh, similar to that of the untreated SHRs. Uh, low in endomesial collagen. Scar collagen is when a myocyte dies off, perhaps due to ischemia, and collagen, uh, replacement collagen, fills in the space where the myocyte was, and we see that there is a lot of this collagen in the untreated SHR. Linking back to uh, some of my previous measurements, SHRs have a high LV mass, which means low efficiency overall. They also perform a lot more work. Uh, this leads to, more, more likely to lead to ischemia at the tissue level, cell death, and more uh, scar fibrosis. And this is confirmed here. Uh, and so it's interesting that the treated SHR uh, group has successfully avoided this by having a lower mean arterial pressure, lowering cardiac work, uh, and also lowering uh, the LV mass. So they're performing more efficiently, and the uh, WKY group also have low levels of scar collagen. Uh, just related to this, from these images, we also looked at the uh, capillaries per mycite area. So you can look at the number of capillaries per mycite which gives you an estimate of how well uh, the tissue is being oxygenated, whether 
uh, the myocytes are likely to get into ischemic trouble. Um, but in the SHRs, we see that the myocytes themselves are a lot bigger um, and have more contractile components and do more work. So it actually makes more sense to look at the number of capillaries per myocyte area. Um, and so we see, uh, just, just looking at this top line, um, the data is best looked at these in these percentiles. We see that the WKYs have a higher value than SHRs, uh, again suggesting that SHRs are likely to form, fall into ischemic trouble. And interestingly, the treated SHRs have higher levels than both controls and SHRs. Um, one hypothesis I had is that the uh, angiogenesis in the SHRs may have a genetic component and um, so they produce more blood vessels than controls but because we have treated them uh, they're not performing the same levels of work and don't have the, the same large myocytes as the untreated SHRs. I uh, wasn't able to confirm this hypothesis but it's just one idea of perhaps why uh, there are many more myocytes than even the control animals. So most of this work so far has been focused on the systolic performance of the heart and in this work we were interested uh, particularly in the diastolic performance as well. So a previous study by Legrice and colleagues looked at ventricular compliance in the SHR, um, so perform pressure volume measurement. So this consists of um, taking out the heart and putting it on a Langendorf rig, perfusing it to ensure that it's uh, still healthy, and then uh, inserting a balloon into the ventricle and inflating this balloon uh, over several steps in order to get these pressure volume measurements. And um, so it's an established way of measuring the, the compliance of the ventricle um, and can be used to infer whether there is more fibrosis or not. So it's generally expected that if there's more fibrosis, the heart will have a lower compliance. Um, and this was confirmed in um, the Grice's study where the, the lowest level of compliance or the most stiff were these 12 month SHRs um, due to both their fibrosis and the thick wall. Um, oh, left the, the labels off here. So the SHRs, all the dark ones, and WKYs, all the dotted lines. So all of the SHRs showed lower compliance than, did, than did the WKYs. Um, and so I performed the same measurements in my study. Uh, so I've got blue treated SHR, red SHR, and green WKY. Unfortunately, my measurements were much less conclusive and I had generally trouble making any sort of sense of them. Um, unfortunately, the, the SHRs all tended to be more compliant than the controls in treated animals, uh, which didn't fit in with the idea of them being uh, more stiff with high levels of collagen, and the treated an animals showed uh, far more variability than we could explain, uh, and this led to us really questioning the validity of the, these results and unfortunately we didn't uh, end up doing anything with them, although I believe that uh, Abdullah is going to continue to try and puzzle over these measurements and uh, all I can say to you is good luck mate. Um, so although we didn't have the experimental data to um, back up any sort of look at the diastolic function, I did put together um, a theoretical framework of how I thought the, um, the changes in microstructure between these different groups would end up having an effect at the um, myocardial tissue level. So just sort of summing up the differences in a uh, relatively crude schematic way, um, black endomesial collagen and WKY and um, purple paramecial cords in the SHR, see thicker endomesial collagen, thicker cords, and also this green uh, paramecial collagen between sheetlets. In the treated SHR, the uh, thickened endomesial collagen, but fairly normal paramecial collagen, and no uh, green 
paramecial collagen between sheetlets. And so thinking about those uh, local coordinate axes again, if we're in the fibre direction, if we were to think about extension, the main contributing uh, components that would provide stiffness in this direction are these uh, paramecial cords. These cords actually connect into the myocytes and um, prevent them from overextension, uh, which would be damaging to their contractile components. Uh, so, so this direction is the stiffest and is contributed to uh, by the paramecial cords, the endomecial collagen, and the green paramecial collagen between sheetlets. If you were to pu pull uh, the sheetlet apart the other direction, uh, the paramecial cords wouldn't really contribute. Mostly the endomecial collagen and the um, paramecial collagen between sheetlets. And then pulling the sheetlets apart, definitely the most important contributing uh, component is this paramecial collagen between sheetlets. Uh, and then thinking about shear, so um, work has been done looking at the shearing properties of the myocardium. Uh, there's six, six different shear types, and in this case I've uh, given a bar to this measurement type as these are simple shear measurements. So you can see here that this plane is moving relative to this one, um, but it's doing so without moving closer to this stationary plane, which means that this fiber direction is actually lengthening relative to its original position. And this means that uh, measurements where you're performing pure shear are effectively um, measuring the, the passive properties of fiber extension. So it's, we see in these measurements that the FS and FN measurements have the highest shear stiffness, um, but this is suggested to be because you're effectively lengthening the fiber axis, which is the most stiff. Uh, you can see here with the FN also pulling along these, uh, this fiber axis. And these uh, other directions are relatively similar. So in my conceptual model, uh, I thought about what I call pure shear, although some people call it uh, sub-simple shear or pure and simple shear. I've just referred to it as pure shear. Um, and my suggestion is that the most important shear in the in vivo condition are these NF and NS shear, uh, prop, um, shear pair where the sheetlets are sliding past one another. Uh, and that the remodeling at the microstructural level in the SHR would uh, deposit collagen between these layers and would have the most effect on this NF and NS shear pair, shear pair <laughs> which would in turn have a big effect on uh, myocardial function as a whole um, because the sheetlet sliding is, most, uh, is, is important for function. And so just a summary, so in part one I looked at uh, in part one I looked at the work and geometry measurements in the three groups um, and found that the SHRs performed normal levels of stroke, stroke volume and cardiac output uh, but did so at a very high level of cardiac work which likely uh, prompts them to um, progress to heart failure. I uh, found that the ACE inhibitor treatment reduced blood pressure and correspondingly reduced the cardiac work. Uh, in the second part I looked at uh, ventricular torsion and unfortunately didn't find good measurements in this RAT data set um, between torsion and geometry but found that the values correlated well with other measures of systolic function which uh, has also been found in previous studies. And then in part three I did novel structural imaging of ACE inhibitor treated SHRs uh, and found this, this novel remodeling where they had high levels of endomecial collagen uh, similar to those 
uh, high levels of endometrial collagen similar to the untreated SHRs, uh, but didn't show the same collagen between sheetlets, which I think is really important for function. Uh, and then developing my conceptual model, I proposed that the uh, structural change in the SHR would most likely affect the NF NS shear pair. Uh, and so if someone was able to perform these pure shear measurements, I would expect that if you were able to compare a WKY and SHR, that this pair of uh, shears would be most different between the two groups. Uh, just the last bit of advice uh, would be to really socialise and make friends. And I summed it up in this meme. I don't always drink coffee, but when I do, I always chat for way too long. I found um, I made so many friends during my PhD and some of them ended up being groomsmen at my wedding, so uh, some pretty tight relationships there. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my supervisors, Ian and Martin, Vicky and Greg, Lindley and Dane, and Alistair and Bo for their help with the MRI, and the rest of the cardiac group, Bianca, Abdullah and Jenny. Uh, thank you for your time. something that's, um, that's also seen in humans, or do, do people go one way or the other? Um, I, th I think it, 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 some, some go, go one way and then the other, and, and some don't. It's, um, I think, summed up quite well here. Uh, Um, that some of them will progress towards one end of the spectrum and will progress pretty consistently towards that end, but uh, some other disease modifiers, so uh, perhaps treatment or st start to uh, relieve pressure, which will um, make this LV mass not, not needed and drop off, uh, but may still progress to failure uh, in any case. So, yeah, there, there's, there's quite a spectrum, um, some of them progress fully and some of them do go one way and then the other. Well, was it clear that the SHRs, have they progressed through the, through the eccentric, the one with the age that you were in, or are they more the... No, the, they continue to dilate, but they still had thick wall. Um, I had 21 months. Yeah, so... so my feeling was that I didn't get to see that thin walled phenotype because so many of them died off before I was able to study them. Um, in other studies, they do um, often, in, in, in the later time point SHRs, they do put them into failure SHRs and non-failure SHRs. Um, and I think, unfortunately, I've captured all the non-failure SHRs, and so I haven't seen this uh, thin walled phenotype. Yeah. Um, because I mean, by definition, diastolic failure is reduced compliance. That's the standard. Uh, that's the standard pathological representation yeah. of it. Yeah. And and, and that was you're what. Seeing the, you're seeing the structural features which you associate with that. Uh, how are you doing the measurements? Um, 
so as, as closely as I could following Adele's um, measurement. So heart onto the Langendorf rig and had a system where put a balloon into the ventricle and inflated it and deflated it. Okay. Um, so if you go back and look at your, I mean, because you also did these hearts with a pressure catheter uh, and, uh, and MRI as well. Yeah. So do they, do they show you the same thing? Because you've, you've got a, effectively a diastolic compliance, you know, pressure volume. Yeah, we have we have single loops to really get the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. You really need multiple uh, volume and loading points to get that relationship. So you you can't really get it from just one loop, which is what we've effectively got. Uh, sure, sure. Um, how do they look? Just go back and look at the. Um, I guess maybe a typical one. Not that one. Your um, your pressure volume. Another problem uh, was that, so for the, for the MRIs, we only got 18 frames through the cardiac cycle. So in that diastolic filling period, we really only got two or maybe three volume frames. So in terms of volume data, we've only sort of got two or three data points. Um, so it's, it's quite hard to pull much off there. Yeah. That's the red one, yeah. The red and the dashed is different ages of the same child. They certainly look um, as though they're going to higher pressures. Um, yeah. But they're also going to higher volumes as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it's um, certainly not what, I, <laughs> not what I expected to see. But yeah, not, not what we expected to see either, and we, we spent a lot of time puzzling over them to try yeah, and. Right. Pull out the something meaningful from them. So, so how you how you how you get the parametric factors and so how you you do manual segmentation? Yeah. So Greg kindly did that manual segmentation for me. Um, these, um, he, he originally performed it for the, the Grice 2012 paper where he did the WKY and SHRs. Um, and then it's a matter of going through pixel by pixel and uh, saying, okay, whether this is uh, endometrial collagen, it's, it's, it's near the, the myocyte, or whether it's more likely to be paramecial collagen. I don't know whether Greg wants to com comment on his judgment calls on each of those pixels. No, so these uh, measurements required high resolution images, which are difficult to get at the uh, 21 month time point. So we don't have it for the, the older age group. But it's generally similar, although in the older um, SHRs, you see almost a complete breakdown of the, the sheetlet structure. Um, so you, you, you may actually see the paramecial collagen between sheetlets drop off, mainly because there starts to be a complete lack of sheetlet structure. So that's sort of a whole other uh, thing to consider. So the graph, the, the ACE is normally Yeah, oh, they, they are used to treat heart failure as well. Okay, so I understand your thesis has been accepted and you officially completed. Yep. That's right. And so what, uh, what plans for the future now? 
Oh, yeah, so um, I secured myself a postdoc at, uh, in the States at the University of South Florida, and so I'll be starting that uh, in August, so it's an exciting step for me. So they have a Heart Institute there, uh, and I'll be doing some more sort of experimental work over there. Um, they look at some nanoparticle treatment after myocardial infarction, and so that seems like an interesting area to get involved in. So we wish you the very best for your future endeavors. And let's thank Alex again.